Studies Department at UCSC. And I've been working in coffee systems for about 15 years now. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I've done um, over that time period um, so that you have a little better understanding of the ecology of coffee systems. Okay, so much technology. All right. Okay, so as probably everybody here is aware, we're facing a global biodiversity crisis right now. Um, there are a large number of species that are going extinct, and one of the main causes, or one of the main reasons for that species extinction is because of agriculture. Okay? Um, however, over the past 20 years or so, a lot of conservation biologists have come to the realization that not all agricultural systems are created equal. And so if you look at the images that are on the screen behind me, these are all farms, these are all agricultural systems, but you can tell that they differ really widely in terms of the types of vegetation, the number of trees, what types of crops are grown in these areas. And so some agricultural systems may actually be very important for protecting biodiversity. Coffee is one crop that has been highlighted as an important system for protecting biodiversity. And so I mainly tonight want to talk about the ecology of coffee systems, but I want to give just a little bit of background um, about some socioeconomic aspects of coffee because coffee is an extremely important crop. So we all know that a lot of us depend on coffee on a daily basis just to get through the day. Um, but what some of you may not know is that coffee is one of the world's most traded commodities. It's often cited as the second most traded commodity, second only to petroleum. Um, and in addition, um, coffee provides livelihoods to hundreds of thousands of uh, smallholders um, or small landowners uh, worldwide. And so it has an extreme economic importance for the daily, um, daily lives of, of hundreds of thousands of people. So where is all this coffee coming from? So this pie chart here shows um, the top 10 coffee producing countries, and this has remained relatively constant over about the past decade. Um, the top four producers, um, Brazil, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Colombia, um, and then a handful of other countries that are listed on there, and I want to point out um, Ethiopia, uh, which rounds out the top 10. That's the origin of Arabica coffee, so that's where it evolved and where it originally comes from. Okay, so as you see by the list of these countries, coffee is mainly coming from the global south. Um, coffee is a crop that is not frost tolerant, so it mainly grows in the tropics and subtropics. But who's drinking all this coffee? us and other people that live in the global north. So if you look at the, the top coffee producing countries, uh, Scandinavia, so Norway, Finland, uh, etc. Um, in the United States we also drink a lot of coffee. Um, between about 8 and 13 pounds of coffee uh, per person per year in the United States. So a lot of coffee consumption. So I want you guys to think, keep this in the back of your minds when you're thinking about the ecology of coffee. Thinking about when we want to make a crop sustainable, how can we do that when the producers are in the global south and the consumers are in the global north? What might need to happen in order to keep um, the cultivation sustainable? Okay, so I'm going to turn now to talk a little bit more about the, the e ecological aspects of coffee farms. So these pictures that are behind me are all pictures of coffee farms. The pictures on the left um, kind of look like natural forests. You can't really see the coffee. You could just see the tree canopies, and aside from a few houses that are in the picture, you wouldn't really know that that's a human-inhabited system. Um, and the pictures on the right are looking at coffee plantations from the, the ground up. In the understory, there are coffee plants, which I usually describe as human-sized shrubs. So they're small plants, um, and they're shaded by a shade tree canopy that grows over the top. Okay, so. The reason, one of the reasons that coffee has been thought of as ecologically important is because of this traditional cultivation system where coffee is growing under the canopy of shade trees. The second major reason that coffee has received a lot of uh, attention for its potential to conserve biodiversity is because of the particular areas of the world in which coffee is grown. So this map behind me shows a, a world map that has um, highlighted on it the biodiversity hotspots. So that's kind of a, a buzzword that was coined by Conservation International several years ago to talk about areas of the planet that have very high biodiversity and have very high habitat destruction. Okay, so those are the, the biodiversity hotspots. 
um, and they're shown in orange. You can see that the coffee producing regions are shown on that map in yellow. And there's a very high correspondence between areas where coffee is grown and these biodiversity hotspots. Okay, so it's easy to imagine that what happens in coffee systems may have a large impact on the biodiversity. If we zoom in, uh, this is a picture of the, or a map of the southern half of Mexico, which is a very important coffee cultivating region in an area where I've been doing research for about 15 years. Um, we see the same sort of pattern. So in the, the hatched area, um, those are areas of coffee production. And the black areas are areas of coffee, um, are of uh, conservation concern. So you can see that there's an almost complete overlap between the areas of conservation concern and the areas of coffee cultivation. Again, it makes it easy for us to think that what happens in the coffee production areas may be affecting the biodiversity. Okay, so this is all fine and good. Farms like this have received a lot of attention for their potential to support biodiversity. Um, however, over about the past 50 years, um, coffee systems have been increasingly intensified into systems that look something like this. So the picture that's on the bottom right, that is a picture of a coffee plantation in the Central Valley of Costa Rica um, that is a very technified or intensified farm. So when I use those terms intensified or technified, it basically means a gradual reduction in the number of trees that are in the canopy, the number of species of trees that are in the canopy, and uh, um, often it's accompanied by an increased use in agrochemicals. So a more sunny farm will have a higher use of agrochemicals. So what does this mean for the potential of these systems to support biodiversity? Well, coffee farms now across the globe can fall into one of these uh, categories that's behind me here. So when we move from the top of this graph to the bottom of this graph, this is what we would refer to as the coffee intensification gradient or the technification gradient. At the very top of the image are rustic coffee farms where coffee is cultivated underneath a natural forest canopy. And at the very bottom of that graph is a sun coffee system that has no trees whatsoever. Um, and so if we move from the top towards the bottom, we're gradually eliminating the number of trees or reducing the number of trees that are in the farm. We're gradually reducing the number of shade tree species that are in the farm. Um, and we're also reducing the height of the canopy. We're reducing the amount of foliage or the amount of leaf cover, which is in the different farms. Um, and so a lot of what I spent my time doing, a lot of my graduate students and colleagues, is looking at the, the ecological implications of this management gradient. So I want to talk to you tonight about three different questions. Yes? The traditional polyculture versus the rustic, like, what is that difference? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So in terms of the, the shade tree, so in the, the rustic farm, that's where the coffee is grown under a natural forest canopy, so it's basically just clearing out the understory and planting coffee. Um, in a traditional polyculture, you still have some of the forest tree species that are there. Um, but there are some fruit trees and timber trees that are planted alongside with the, the forest trees. Um, in a commercial polyculture, all of the forest tree species are gone and it's mainly planted shade, so usually fruit trees, timber trees, nitrogen fixing legumes, um, and then the shaded monoculture will just be um, one or two species of shade tree in the farm. So excellent question, yeah. Yeah, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, what these changes in coffee management mean for biodiversity what the changes in coffee management mean for ecosystem services. And finally, ask the question, is it possible to brew biodiversity? Okay, so I've mentioned already a couple of times that coffee farms have received a lot of attention for the potential that they have to protect biodiversity. But I haven't really given any evidence of why this is the case or how we even began to, to think about this. And so we have to look back into history a little bit and look to some research that was done on migratory birds. So of course there's a lot of people, how many of you are bird watchers? Anybody out there? A couple people. So um, there are a lot of bird watchers in this country, something like, I don't know, millions of bird watchers. And, um, and a lot of ornithologists, people who are studying birds and trying to understand what's happening to migratory birds. So back in the, the 1980s, a lot of scientists started noting that there were dramatic declines in the populations of migratory birds. 
most scientists were very focused on deforestation in the global north and the impact of that deforestation on these migratory birds. Um, of course, that's where they breed, that's where they have uh, their uh, offspring, and so what happens in those northern forests is going to be very important. Okay? However, migratory birds such as these, these three species, the American Red Star, Tennessee Warbler, and the Baltimore Oriole, they spend eight or nine months out of the year in the blue areas in the map, or in northern Latin America. If you remember from the map I showed a few slides ago, this is the same area where a lot of coffee is produced. Okay, so some scientists at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, specifically Russell Greenberg, started asking the question, well, what about deforestation in the tropics? How is that influencing these migratory birds? So basically what he did was to do a bunch of bird surveys in Central America. He worked in forested habitats, and then he also surveyed a number of different agricultural habitats, including shade coffee farms, cattle pastures, and cornfields throughout Central America. Basically asking the question, um, which habitats have more birds? He found out that the diverse shaded coffee farms support as many species of birds as did the nearby forests, and that the diverse shaded coffee farms had more migratory birds than any other agricultural habitat. So this was about 1995 that this study was published and it really opened people's eyes to the importance of uh, land use in the tropics for conservation of birds and other organisms. So the farms where, where Rust was working were rustic coffee farms, where there's very high number of species. And we might hypothesize that in a farm where there are no trees, we may have very low biodiversity, because we're eliminating the resources, we're eliminating the places where these organisms are going to nest, and, and so forth. And so far there's about 100 different scientific studies that have asked this question for different types of organisms, and there's a lot of consensus about those two points on the graph. The debate comes in when we try to connect those dots and try to figure out what's the exact pattern of biodiversity loss depending on the type of shade coffee that we're talking about. And figuring out that pattern of biodiversity loss is incredibly important, especially if scientists, if we want to connect with farmers, we want to connect with extension agents and educate them or discuss with them the possibilities of protecting biodiversity within their farms. We need to know exactly what this pattern looks like. So I did a study several years ago where I looked that all of the literature that I could find on the studies that had investigated ant biodiversity and that had investigated bird biodiversity in a number of different coffee management systems. And I specifically looked at forest specialist species and all species of ants and birds that were found in these different habitats and asked the question, how does the pattern of biodiversity loss differ for ants and birds? How does it differ for forest species and for all species considered together? For ants, this is what I found. So it turns out that forest ants, this bottom green line, were quite sensitive to any changes in the coffee management system. You eliminate just a few trees and you eliminate a lot of species of ants. If we ask the question about all ant species that are found within that habitat, they were somewhat more uh, resilient, only with large biodiversity declines in the most intensive systems. The pattern was somewhat similar for birds. Again, we saw that forest birds, oops, but the forest birds declined um, more rapidly than the all birds considered together. But one really important thing that I want you guys to notice from this graph is that if we're looking at the rustic coffee systems, the far left system here, that they did pretty well at protecting bird and ant biodiversity. And as you intensify the system, you gradually lose biodiversity. The pattern differs a little bit, but you intensify it and you lose biodiversity. So the take home message to me from this study was that rust rustic coffee systems do protect biodiversity and they do a better job of protecting biodiversity than the other types of shaded coffee systems. So I want to show you these three images to kind of drive home the point of what I'm talking about. So the image on the top left is a rustic coffee farm, and that's the style of coffee farm that protects a large amount of biodiversity. The farm in the middle, where you can see some scattered trees, but those lines that you see there are the coffee plants, so it's a little more open. That type of farm protects some of the biodiversity, not all, but it still does a pretty good job. This system, where you see these sticks that hardly have any leaves, those are trees, and everything else that you see in the picture are coffee plants. 
So technically, that is shade coffee because there are trees there. But that shade coffee is not really protecting any biodiversity at all. Okay, so if we want to protect biodiversity, we need this kind of farm or maybe this kind of farm. Okay, so the second question that I want to address um, is talking about whether changes in coffee management affect ecosystem services. Okay, so I'm aware that a lot of you know what ecosystem services are, but maybe some of you don't, so I want to explain what I mean by that term. An ecosystem service is uh, an ecological function that sustains and improves human life. So a couple of examples of ecosystem services include things like the production of food and water, control of climate and disease, nutrient cycling, pollination, pest control, and also spiritual and recreational benefits. So basically things that nature provides for the benefit of humans. Some people have assessed the dollar value that nature provides for the benefit of humans to be between 16 and 54 trillion dollars a year. So it's a big deal. Nature is doing a lot for us. So what about in coffee farms? What are different types of ecosystem services that are provided in coffee farms? And how do those ecosystem services, depending on if we're talking about a farm with a lot of shade or with not very much shade at all? So I want to talk about four different ecosystem services. Um, first, I'm going to focus on pollination. Okay, I have in these tiny little numbers here that maybe you can't read. There have been a total of seven studies that have compared pollination services in highly shaded farms and sun or low shade farms. Okay? And 58% of those studies have found that shade is beneficial. So what do I mean by that? So coffee pollination, just a brief summary, that is the movement of floral gametes, so in other words, it's plant sex. Um, Robusta, which is one of the main species of coffee, that's a lowland, uh, low quality variety of coffee, and that's the stuff that goes into Taster's Choice and Folgers and that kind of stuff. Um, that species of coffee requires pollination in order to produce fruits. The Arabica coffee, which is the specialty coffee or the high elevation coffee, it doesn't require, but it certainly benefits from having pollination services. So some of my colleagues did a study in Indonesia several years ago where they went to many different types of coffee farms and they first surveyed the coffee farms to find out how many bees and how many bee species were in those coffee farms. And the second thing that they did was to figure out which farms had the best pollination services. So they first found that bee diversity and abundance increased in the farms that had more shade, in the farms that had higher plant diversity, and in the farms that were closer to forest fragments. The second thing that they found was that as the number of bee species increased, the pollination success also increased. That means higher coffee yields. So if you have more bee species, you have higher coffee yields. So this is one piece of evidence that increasing the shade in the coffee farm actually benefits the farmers by increasing the coffee yields through the pollination services. Okay, the second ecosystem service that I want to talk about, and I'll spend a little more time on this because this is where I've done the bulk of my research, um, is looking at pest control services. So there are about 40 studies that have examined pest control services in different kinds of coffee farms, comparing a high shade farm to a low shade farm or a sun farm, for example. And 60% of those studies find that shade is a benefit for this ecosystem service. Okay, so I've already talked a little bit about birds and the fact that bird biodiversity is higher in these highly shaded farms. So what are the birds actually doing in coffee farms? Well, many birds are insectivores, meaning that they feed on insects. And so one focus of research um, was trying to figure out whether or not the birds are actually having a beneficial impact in these coffee farms. And so one way that scientists examine this beneficial impact is by putting up Explosures. This is basically a fishnet that we put over the coffee plants. And then we have other plants where um, birds are able to get access. So birds are eliminated from these plants and they can get on these. And then we can study what's the impact of these birds on herbivores or crop pests? What's the impact of the birds on plant damage? And what's the impact of the birds on the coffee yields altogether? So I'm going to give a couple examples of these types of exposure studies and what the researchers have found. Okay, so first of all, I want to uh, focus on studies that were done in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica by some researchers from Humboldt State University. 
and they were specifically investigating the impacts of birds on one important crop pet of coffee, which is this tiny insect here. Well, you can see it. Um, that, the name of that insect is the coffee berry borer, and it's about two millimeters, so it's a teeny tiny thing, and basically what it does is the adult females will make a tunnel that goes directly into the coffee fruit. It goes in there and it lays gazillions of eggs, and when the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the inside of the coffee fruit, ruining the coffee beans. Okay, so it's a very damaging pest that has direct negative impacts on coffee yield. So what these researchers did was they set up exclosure studies, so they had some plants without birds and some plants with birds. And then on those plants, they counted the number of coffee berry borers that were attacking coffee fruits. <coughs> and this is what they found. So at the beginning of the experiment, which is on the, the far left, you can see that there were a high number of coffee berry borers on the plants with birds, but as time went on, the number of berry borers declined. The birds were eating the berry borers. But on the other plants, where there were no birds, you started out with a few number of berry borers, but that number increased, and so by the end, you had a significantly higher number of fruits that were attacked by the berry borer where there were no birds. So basically, the birds are feeding on this pest and protecting the coffee. They also calculated that this ecosystem service is worth about $75 per hectare. So that might not seem like a lot of money to us, but for a Jamaican farmer, that could potentially increase their income by 75%. So it was a, a big deal for, for these Jamaican farmers. Okay, so that tells us that birds are important at controlling pests, but it doesn't really tell us whether or not the service is better in a shaded farm versus a non-shaded farm. So I wanna show one experiment that some um, colleagues of mine did in Southern Mexico, um, where they compared the impact of birds on pests in two different types of coffee farms. And you've seen these pictures before. So this is a farm, a rustic farm, that has very high diversity and density of trees. And this is um, a middle of the road farm, where I call here a simple shade farm, where it has some trees, but not as many as in the high shade farm. And within both of those farms, they set up exclosures. So they had areas with birds and areas without birds. And then they went out in the very early part of the morning before sunrise and before the birds woke up, and they introduced thousands of caterpillars onto the coffee plants. Okay, they're corn pests, so there was no risk that they were gonna eat the coffee. But they took them out there because they wanted to see how many of them would be removed by birds in the two types of farms. In the simple shade farm, there were a few of the caterpillars that were removed, but there was no difference between the plants with and without birds. So that means that in the simple shade farms, birds weren't doing anything. But in the high shade farm, there were a lot of caterpillars that were missing, and there were more caterpillars missing on the plants with birds than on the plants without birds. So basically what they found is that birds are providing very important pest control services, but only in the complex shade farm. So again, evidence that having more shade is benefiting the farmers because they're the birds are providing better pest control. Okay, so one final piece of evidence with birds, and then I'll move on to another organism, um, is over many of these studies, there have been something like 20 different studies that have looked at the impacts of birds in coffee farms. Um, a lot of them have found that birds remove pests and they remove potential pests. They found that birds reduce plant damage to the coffee and that the birds can increase coffee yields. So one thing that I was really curious uh, at examining um, was looking at whether or not the number of bird species within the habitat was also associated with increased removal of pest items. And we were really lucky that in all of these different studies where people have put up the bird exposures, that they also did very extensive surveys of the bird community or the number of bird species that was there. And so we examined again the relationship between the number of bird species and the percent of insects that were removed on the plant. And we found very significant positive correlations. So where the number of bird species was higher, remember that's of course in the very highly shaded farms, that that is where the pest control services or the insect removal services were the highest. Pretty convincing. Okay, so I wanna move on to talking about ants. I can't give a talk without talking about ants because that's my favorite organism, but I spend a lot of time researching. Um, and what you're looking at here, this is an up close and personal picture of a coffee berry borer, that black dot right there. 
Um, and this is a, a ground foraging ant that actually will crawl up onto the coffee shrubs to remove the coffee berry borers from the coffee fruits. Okay. Um, and there have been a lot of studies, um, primarily in Mexico and Colombia, that have examined the role of ants as predators of coffee pests. So I want to show one video that was actually filmed by somebody sitting in the audience. And watch closely, it's an ant removing a coffee berry borer. as soon as this pest gets on the coffee plant, they're there, ready to remove it instantaneously. Um, and Esteli <laughs> took this video. <laughs> and she saw this hundreds of times, so with two different ant species. Um, this is an arboreal ant species, and the other one was a ground nesting ant species. Both of them removed the berry borers very quickly. They can kill them. Sometimes they carry them to the nest and will actually kill them. Um, what happens likely in this scenario when they drop it off the coffee plant, that there's hundreds of species of ants on the ground that will come and attack the berry borer once it gets onto the ground. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so that's some, some photographic evidence. Um, and I have a couple of graphs, too. So this is a, an experiment that I did with a, a student who's now a PhD student at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, where we did a bunch of lab experiments to figure out which species of ants could potentially control the coffee berry borer, and we documented that all four of the ant species that we examined effectively killed the, the coffee berry borers in the lab, but we also wanted to look at what they were doing in the field. And so we set up exclosures, not with big nets, but with tanglefoot, that great stuff you can put in your garden to keep the Argentine ant off of your citrus tree. Um, we did the same thing in this coffee plantation, and then we introduced a bunch of berry borers onto the coffee plants, and saw how many of uh, the berry borers were removed on plants with and without ants. So again, here we have with ants in white, without ants in gray. And we did this in a number of coffee farms <coughs> of different management types, and this is the result that we found. So this is a really confusing and large graph, but the one thing that I want you to focus on is the difference between the gray bar and the white bar in the rustic coffee system. This was the only system where there was a significant difference between the with ant and without ant treatment. So only in the most rustic coffee farms were ants very effective at removing the coffee berry borer. Okay, so the difference between those two bars, we saw that the predation effect was larger in more shaded farms. A second study that a colleague of mine did in, in Colombia um, I love this experiment because the, the traps are so cool. So these are some traps that she made that were handmade for this experiment. Basically, it's a, a glass orb, and it has this spiral going up into the orb, and then the top is corked, like a wine bottle. So what she did was to take off the cork, put some coffee berry borers in the spiral, and then put them out into the coffee farms. And she did this in high shade farms and in low shade farms, both in the wet season and the dry season in Colombia. So how the spirals work is that ants are smart enough to crawl up the spiral and go in there looking for prey. They get in there, they find a coffee berry borer, they kill it, and then they carry it out of the spiral. But the coffee berry borers are too dumb to figure out how to get out of the spiral, so the coffee farm owners were protected from having this pest invasion in their farms because of the experiment. Okay, so this is what my colleague found, that in the high shade farms, there was much better removal of these coffee berry borers than in the low shade farm, either 13% higher or 3% or three times as high, um, depending on the season. So again, we see evidence that the more highly shaded farm has better pest control services. Okay, and finally, to show some work that uh, a Mexican PhD student of mine has done, um, that he looked at a different coffee pest, which is called the coffee leaf miner. Um, this is a picture of what the damage caused by that pest looks like. It's basically a moth larva that creates these tunnels inside of the coffee leaves and makes it so that the coffee leaves can't photosynthesize anymore so they can't produce any energy. Um, and basically what he did was to go out onto a bunch of coffee plants and count the number of ants and the number of ant nests that were on those coffee plants and also the amount of damage that was caused by the, the leaf miner. And he found that where you had a higher number of ant species that you had much lower leaf miner damage. 
Okay, so again, where ant diversity is high, you have better pest control. So is that graph showing the number of nests or the number of species or both somehow? Um, this graph is for the number of ant nests, but the graph for the number of species is almost identical. Oh, okay. So, yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so enough about pest control. Hopefully you got the message. Pest control is better than shaded farms. Right? So nutrient recycling, I'm not going to say anything about nutrient recycling other to say that it, other to say that it happens in coffee farms. Um, talking about decomposition processes, returning nutrients into the soil, which is really important for coffee cultivation, of course. Um, there's 10 studies that have looked at that, and 93% of them have found benefits of shade compared to unshaded coffee. But I will say a few words about this final ecosystem service, um, which is buffering the effects of climate change and protecting coffee farms from natural disasters. So there are 13 studies that have looked at these um, pair of ecosystem services, and 100% of them have found that shaded coffee farms are more important um, in protecting farmers from natural disasters and climate change. Okay, so what do we know about climate change and coffee? We know that climate change is going to have very large impacts on coffee production. Okay, it's likely going to force coffee to be grown at higher elevations. There's going to be dramatic changes in temperature fluctuations, in the amount of rainfall in different coffee producing areas, and it's not going to be consistent across everywhere in the world where coffee is grown. Um, but we do know that there's a very narrow range of ideal temperature and humidity conditions under which coffee thrives. And we also know that when there are very large fluctuations in temperature and humidity, that that can lower the quality of the coffee beans themselves. Okay, so it's not just a quantity issue, but here we're talking about a coffee quality issue. So one of my colleagues, um, Brenda Lynn, did a study in uh, southern Mexico where she compared three types of coffee farms, a high shade, medium shade, and a low shade coffee farm. And she monitored them for several weeks um, over a 24-hour period to see how much the temperature and humidity fluctuates within those three different types of coffee farms. And this is what she found. <laughs> so on the bottom, we have the time of day going from midnight to midnight. And on the y-axis, we have the temperature. So if you first focus in on the line with the black dots, that's the low shade coffee farm. And you can see that there are very dramatic lows and very dramatic highs in that particular type of coffee farm. Whereas the high shade farm, which is in the green, had much lower fluctuations. So remember that these fluctuations are bad, they can lower the quality of the coffee, but in high shade farms, the fluctuations are minimized compared to in a low shade coffee farm. The results that she found for humidity were almost identical, so the humidity fluctuated much less um, within the high shade farm compared with the low shade farm. So that's one piece of evidence that high shade farms may indeed buffer some of these extreme uh, temperature and humidity events uh, within coffee farms. The second example that I want to talk about um, concerns hurricanes. So with climate change, hurricanes, uh, many people believe that hurricanes are going to become more frequent and that they're going to become more intense. Um, and so one question that I had is, you know, well, how can different coffee farms um, buffer these effects of natural disasters <laughs> such as hurricanes? So it was an unfortunate circumstance that um, in 2005, there was a very large hurricane that came through an area where I had been working in southern Mexico, um, Hurricane Stan. And it created um, very dramatic landslides. There were um, a couple thousand people that lost their lives during this hurricane. Um, but I had been working in this area for a long time, and so I had a lot of information about the vegetation in different coffee farms in the region. So I was able to go back after the hurricane and see how these different farms had fared with the excessive rain rainfall and winds that came about um, as a part of the hurricane. One important thing to note is that the hurricane happened um, when the coffee plants looked like this. So those are ripe coffee fruits. And the hurricane happened just as the farmers were beginning the harvest. So basically what happened is these torrential rains came and they knocked half of the fruit off of the coffee plants onto the ground where they started to rot as it rained for two weeks. So I wanted to examine in this study the economic losses that were caused to farmers that had different types of management systems. Um, I wanted to look at the landslides. So the landslides that occurred um, are very major in this area. They're all dirt roads, and so when there's a landslide, it actually completely blocks the transportation in and out of the farms and isolates people from food, from uh, markets, and whatnot. 
Um, and we also looked at um, landslide risk factors that included not only the coffee management, but also a lot of topographic features like elevation and slope that you would generally associate with um, higher um, landslide risk. So what we found is that the different types of coffee farms didn't actually differ in terms of the economic losses caused by the rain. So all farms suffered about um, a 50% loss of their harvest that year. But what we did find that was really um, surprising to us is that fewer landslides um, and less area of the farm was affected in shadier farms. Furthermore, coffee management was the most important factor that was predicting the risk for landslides in this landscape. So more important than elevation, more important than slope, more important than distance from waterways, that coffee management was the thing that was determining who had landslides and who didn't have landslides. So this is really important evidence to us to indicate that shade coffee is also protecting farmers from these climate fluctuations and also from the impacts of hurricanes. So one thing that I like to point out here is that usually when we talk about natural disasters, it's like, well, I can't do anything as a hurricane. What am I going to do to protect myself? It's like this massive thing that's happening. However, this case shows that coffee farmers could actually plant more trees and protect themselves, and that's exactly what happened after this hurricane. The farmers themselves saw that having more trees, their neighbors that had more trees, were protected and didn't have as many landslides, so they started planting trees as a response to this um, natural disaster. <coughs> Okay, so, um, so far, um, I hope I've shown you that the simplification of the shade canopy eliminates biodiversity from coffee farms, that biodiversity and um, shade loss reduces pollination and pest control services, and also that the loss of canopy complexity um, can reduce the um, protection to climate extremes and natural disasters. Okay, so I want to turn to this final question, um, and think about how, um, whether or not it's possible to brew biodiversity. Okay, so this question um, was a major question um, that came about during the Sustainable Coffee Congress um, that took place in 1996, and this is when uh, a lot of people um, from the booming specialty coffee industry came together to talk about um, how we might think about sustainability within coffee farms. Um, and specifically, a lot of folks at this conference started talking a lot more about certification. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with certification? Probably most people have heard of like organic produce, that's a certified organic, right? Um, so within coffee, there are three major types of certification. There's organic certification, there's fair trade certification, and there's shade certification. So the shade grown certification is really what came about as part of the Sustainable Coffee Congress in 1996. The other two forms of certification already existed um, and were thriving within the coffee industry. Shade, well, certification in general, um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, is basically where producers will solicit that inspectors come to their farms and look at a number of different management practices or coffee processing practices or farm worker conditions and so forth and figure out whether or not their farm or their business qualifies for one of these certifications. One really important um, part of certification is that it includes an independent third party person or organization. So it's not the farmer that's certifying themselves or it's not the roaster that's certifying themselves. It's a third party individual organization that will come in and do this. So organic certification, I won't spend much time on this because I'm sure most people are familiar with it. Organic certification for coffee is just like organic certification for other types of crops, um, that agrochemicals are not allowed, um, and that organic certification does promote soil conservation. It also promotes composting and nutrients within the soil and whatnot. Shade certification. Um, is a certification that's really focused on biodiversity conservation as its major goal. And there are two organizations that currently certify um, shade-grown coffee. Um, the first one is the um, bird-friendly seal that is managed by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. You may remember that those are the first people that started actually studying biodiversity within um, coffee agroecosystems or coffee farms. And the other organization is the Rainforest Alliance that has the Rainforest Alliance seal. So both of these certifications um, have their primary goal of biodiversity conservation, 
they have very technical criteria that pertain to the shade tree canopy. So how many trees are there, how many tree species are there, how tall are the trees, so they're really focused on the scientific basis um, for this data. Okay, so a little bit more about each of these different um, seals or each of these different certifications. Um, the bird friendly program, as I mentioned, um, is um, based on, the criteria are based on research. So the same people that were studying birds in coffee farms actually developed the criteria that are now used by inspectors when they go to farms. Um, bird friendly also requires organic certification before a farm can be um, bird friendly certified. Um, there's currently about 2,500 producers of bird friendly coffee and they produce about 8 million pounds of coffee per year. Um, roasters in the United States, Canada, and Japan, and a number of different um, producer countries. Bird friendly is often re referred to as the, the gold star um, or the gold standard in shade certification um, because the criteria are extremely rigorous. So many producers complain that it's very difficult in order to be um, certified. Um, as bird friendly, and um, I'll definitely acknowledge it is very um, stringent criteria. But one thing that I like as a consumer um, of somebody who potentially could buy bird friendly coffee is that I know that the standards are very rigorous, and I know that the standards that apply in these farms will actually protect biodiversity and protect ecosystem services because I know what the farms need to look like. Uh, the Rainforest Alliance Certified Program also has used um, research in order to develop their criteria. Um, they don't require organic certification, but they do promote integrated pest management, um, which basically means that the coffee pr producers are encouraged to only use um, agrochemicals in case of dire emergency when they really feel that it's necessary. Um, one interesting thing to note is that Rainforest Alliance will actually certify um, sun coffee farms um, if the coffee farm has a very large forest fragment. So this is another approach to doing conservation within agricultural landscapes that is different than only focusing on the management system itself, but focuses on the entire landscape. And this is um, fairly common in Brazil, where some landholders have very large forest fragments next door to their sun coffee farms. Um, the Rainforest Alliance certified seal is much larger than bird friendly. There's um, about 250 estate farms, which are large farms and also many, many cooperatives, um, and their annual sales are around a billion dollars. So I want to bring up this thing, which is not a certification, but it's the other thing that we can call non-certified shade coffee. So I have this package here. This is a coffee package from the Thanksgiving Coffee Company. Um, it's called Songbird Coffee. It has a picture of some bird. I'm not a birder, so I don't know what that is. Um, and we clearly recognize that it has the fair trade seal on it. It has the OCIA organic certified seal, and then it has this green bird that's called shade grown. And so that seal is not either the Bird Friendly Certified Coffee or the Rainforest Alliance Certified Coffee. It's another picture that looks like a bird. Um, and if you look at um, some other informational websites, this is an image that I took from a, um, a web page that's called Songbird Coffee. It's um, an organization in Seattle that came about um, around 1996 when a lot of people were talking about um, shade ground coffee. And they actually classify it here. They have the fair trade symbol, another fair trade symbol, the bird friendly symbol, rainforest alliance symbol, um, certified organic. And then they have this thing that's called independent shade grown. So when I look at that, that means to me that that's a farmer that's doing self certification or that's a roaster that's saying, oh yeah, there's trees there. So I don't mean to pick on Thanksgiving coffee in the, le in the least. I don't mean to pick on any coffee roaster that has this kind of coffee, because it's very common. You find shade grown coffee everywhere, but very little of it is actually certified. But the thing that I want to remind you guys of is these two pictures. So remember when I was talking about the scientific evidence about biodiversity conservation and also about ecosystem services, that this is a farm that is a bird friendly certified farm and a rainforest alliance certified farm. It is a farm that protects biodiversity and pr protects ecosystem services within the farm. This is a farm that could be considered a shade coffee farm. Remember the little sticks with no leaves? But those are trees, and so technically that's a shade coffee farm. However, this type of coffee shade coffee farm does not protect biodiversity and does not protect ecosystem services. So if you buy certified coffee, you know that you're buying coffee that comes from a place that looks like that. If you buy independently certified coffee, you might be purchasing coffee from a place that looks like that, but you could also be purchasing coffee from a place that looks like that. 
So, just something to think about. Okay, so just to, to sum up, um, I hope what I've expressed to you all tonight um, is that coffee is really an ecosystem, that coffee systems are, are model systems for studying biodiversity loss, for studying ecological interactions, um, for understanding that complex shade can protect biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, and to encourage you that as consumers, we play a very big role in terms of the conservation or the sustainability of coffee farms. And so, in my opinion, by buying certified coffee, either shade ground coffee or a multiple certified coffee, um, that we might actually be able to brew biodiversity. So with that, thanks. I'll be happy to take questions. was has there any been uh, work done looking at how shade affects the pathogens of coffee yeah um, that's a good question so um, some of you may have heard that last year there was a um, very large outbreak of the coffee rust which is a fungal disease that pretty much decimated all the coffee production in Central America last year um, and it's also what led to the conversion of all of Sumatra and Sri Lanka from coffee production to tea production so it's a really um, powerful fungal pathogen um, there's some work that has looked at the, the impact of shade on the coffee rust specifically. Um, some research that was done by Lorena Sotopinto in South Mexico, she actually did um, some studies looking at um, how the, the rust differed in different types of coffee plantations. Um, there was one study that was done that I think is particularly interesting where they put a bunch of um, fluorescent powder kind of trying to resemble the fungal spores onto coffee plants. And they did this in a sun coffee farm and in a shade coffee farm. And then they came back in the middle of the night with black lights to kind of show where all of the phosphorescent powder had drifted within the coffee farms, trying to simulate is this how a fungal disease would spread. And they found that in the sun coffee farms where there are these like really straight long rows, that the, the spores or the phosphorescent stuff had like spread really far down the rows, but in the shade coffee it hadn't moved very far at all. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one evidence that, you know, the, the shade may influence the, the spread of the fungal pathogens. Um, there's, you know, but you might think the exact opposite, that if you're in a shade farm that has higher humidity, that has um, lower temperatures, that those might be really ideal conditions for the pathogen to grow. Um, it turns out that it's really complicated because there's so many factors that are influencing the pathogens. It could be the coffee plant density, how close together they are. It could be, you know, the time of year. So I don't think, I mean, yeah, there has been a lot of work done looking at the fungal pathogens <coughs> in coffee, but I don't think there's a clear story about, you know, is it better or worse in a shade or sun farm. Are you going to presenting this to sun coffee? Um, you mean, am I presenting this to the, the farmers? Yeah, it's a great question. The question was, um, you know, have I presented some of this research to sun coffee farmers? Um, to be honest, no, I haven't. Um, and it's, I always get asked this question every time I feel very guilty because it's something that I definitely should do more, um, is doing more outreach to farmers. Um, I've definitely talked to a lot of smallholder farmers, um, but my experience has mainly been in Mexico and you hardly ever find some coffee farms in Mexico, and so I definitely have talked to farmers that have, you know, kind of the shade coffee with the sticks variety. Definitely talked to some of those kind of farmers, and, um, you know, it's interesting because, I didn't talk about this at all, but one of the, the main reasons that coffee farmers cite, um, you know, why would they want to eliminate the shade canopy in the first place, um, is because of the perception that the yields will be higher in sunnier coffee. And um, that definitely can be the case, but it's almost always accompanied by a really high use of agrochemicals. And we don't have evidence of whether or, no, whether or not those high yields can be sustained for a really long time, and they can in the short run, but we don't know about the, the long term. Um, and so that's something to, to think about for sure. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. It seems like if they uh, doesn't benefit them economically, or they're probably that way. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a good point, that it may not benefit them economically to grow their coffee in 
I was just wondering, you compare the different types of coffee farms to each other, but what about to like a natural forest? What does the biodiversity look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I compared the different types of coffee farms, but I didn't necessarily talk about the relationship between coffee farms and the forest. Um, so in the um, earlier on when I had those kind of funky graphs like connecting the dots between the biodiversity loss, all of those studies were actually comparing the biodiversity to what we found in the forest. Um, and so in the, the rustic farms, the biodiversity levels were fairly similar to what we found in the forest. They were a little bit lower. Um, but the, the point that I always try to make um, is, you know, what we really need to be comparing the coffee to is not the forest because there aren't hardly any forests remaining. We need to co compare the coffee to other types of agricultural systems, like cattle pastures um, with no trees or looking at cornfields or looking at other types of ag agriculture. So clearly we need corn, we need other types of agriculture in order to sustain our lives. But, you know, from what the data looks so far, um, coffee farms are one of the best choices for biodiversity conservation and, and cannot substitute entirely for the natural forest, but they do a pretty good job. Um, is reforestation possible? You mean within coffee farms? Yeah, within the sun farms. Um, I think reforestation is possible. It becomes um, really difficult. Um, a good question. I mean, I don't think that I have ever really seen a coffee farm being converted from a sun coffee into a shade coffee farm, for example. I've seen a lot of sun coffee farms being converted into pineapple or cattle pasture or other things like that. Um, I think most of the coffee farms um, that are in, you know, Brazil or in uh, Costa Rica are fairly large farms with farmers that have slightly more economic means. And so for them, it makes sense to convert to a different crop altogether rather than try to, you know, go, go back to a, um, a shaded coffee farm. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's something that I've definitely thought about and, um, you know, what would it be like to do habitat restoration within a coffee farm? What would it take? Um, what kind of measures? And there's definitely some other people in the room that have experience with doing restoration in agricultural systems. Why does the ant remove the coffee berry borer? Um, they eat them. So most ants are um, generalist predators. So they eat sugar, they tend aphids, they tend scale insects, but they also require protein. Um, and so a lot of the ants will kill the berry borers, they'll take them back to their colonies, um, and they will actually feed them to the larvae within the colony. You mean how they actually get the berry board? Yeah, yeah, that, no, that's a great question. So in that case, um, as so Lee carried them in a little plastic bucket and put it on top of the leaf, so you know she was collecting them and providing them for the ants. Um, but there, it, there are different strategies depending on the ants that we're talking about. So there are some ants that are very slender, um, and they can actually crawl into the tunnel and grab the berry borer with their mandibles and then pull it out.